So today we're going to be hearing from uh, speakers who will be sharing their first experiences with harm and discuss how their fears inspire their work. Um, this is going to be a 50 minute panel, 40 minutes of those being the speakers talking, um, discussing, and then the last 10 minutes will be open to audience for questions and to be able to share what turns, you know, you want to share your experience of what turned you on Tara. Okay, so with that, let me go ahead and introduce first um, what the Horror Writers Association is, the organization, and then from there I'll introduce the speakers. So the Horror Writers, um, Horror Writers Association was formed in the late 1980s. It's a nonprofit organization of writers and publishing professionals around the world dedicated to promoting dark literature um, and the interest of those who write it. They are the sponsors of the, of the annual Bram Stoker Award, and if you want to learn more about the HWA you know, after the panel, please feel free to come up and grab up one of these brochures, and you'll be able to find all the information that you need over HWA and how to join and well, so on and so forth. All right, so now let me go ahead and introduce the panelists. First we have Fred Weissey. It's actually pronounced Wee. Okay, think Fred of a ro Think of a roller coaster. Wee. <laughs> so first and we you're have, off and running. Yep, he's got it. So first we have Fred Wee. Yeah, he teaches creative writing to children of all ages and adults. He is also a professional best-selling author and member of the HWA. Um, however, his novels, books, short stories, and screenplays cross over um, genres into urban fantasy, science fiction, supernatural thrillers, paranormal suspense, and more. He writes for both adults and young adults. Next, we have Scott Siegler, and he's the number one New York Times best-selling author and is the creator of 15 novels, six novellas, and dozens of short stories. He gives away his stories um, as weekly serialized audiobooks with over 40 million episodes downloaded. Um, Scott launched his career by releasing his novels as author read podcasts, and his rabid fans were so hungry for each week's episode that they dubbed themselves the Junkies. Um, the first hit is always free. He is also <laughs> co-founder of MTC wow. Entertainment, which publishes his Galactic Football League series. And he lives in San Diego, California, with his wee little dog, Reese. 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 And then sitting next to Scott, we have Richard Cad Cadry. Cadry. Um, and he is the New York Times best-selling author of over a dozen novels, including the Sandman Slim Supernatural Noir series. The Sandman Slim was included in Amazon's 100 science fiction and fantasy books to read in a lifetime. And Chad Stelisky of John Wick fame is said to direct it as a featured film. His latest novel is Hollywood Dead. Next to Richard, we have Lauren Rhodes. And Lauren is the author of, the, of In the Wake of the Templars trilogy, which brought grimdark to space opera, according to Publishers Weekly. She is a co-author of Lost Angels, a dark urban fantasy about a succubus trying to take an angel down. Her new project is a series of chapbooks which includes stories published in Best New Horror and Frightmare, with uh, Women Write Horror. She is also a member of the HWA and has been so since 2001. And at the very end, we have L.S. Johnson. Um, L.S. is the author of the gothic novellas Hawkworth Hall and Leviathan. Her first collection, Vacuumagia. Vacuumagia. Vacuum. Vacuum. Listen to her, not me. Was a finalist for the World Fantasy uh, Award, and her novel remains vexedly in progress. And like I said, I'll be your moderator, and I'm a indie. I'm an indie author, um, an indie award-winning Latinx author of stories about damaged heroes and imperfect villains. My works include To Nurture and Kill on the Deadbringer, which Bookless described as a fantastic action adventure tinged with Mexican folklore that will appeal to fans of Game of Thrones. Okay, so right before we jump into the questions, I'm going to lay down some ground rules. And if anyone on the panel, if any of the speakers would like to respond to what's said, please raise your hand and I'll get back to you after the question is finished. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So this first question is for all the panelists. Let's start with you, Fred. So what led you to being interested in horror? And how have your views on the genre developed over your time as an author? Okay, so I, I got started in horror, well, I've always loved horror. As a kid, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and I collected the old Aurora horror monster models and put them together. Uh, my brother and I collected them together. Uh, but my own fears is really what got me um, really into horror. Uh, and I have to thank my brother for part of that because 
I had this great fear of claustrophobia, thanks to him. So we shared a bedroom, and he would, uh, at times, attack me, roll me up in my own blankets, and throw me into the closet, upside down usually on my head, and then shut the door and hold it shut. And I'd have to try to fight my way out of these blankets. It felt like a straitjacket. Um, and finally, when I did, pounding on the door, um, and he would hold it until my dad would finally come up and say, let him out. Uh, and that fear of claustrophobia kind of went into a fear of being buried alive. Um, and, and I'm really a broken person. And a lot of other fears. <laughs> a lot of other fears. And I find that writing horror is very cathartic for me to work through those kinds of things. Uh, like, for instance, in uh, one of my novels, Alaric Monster Hunter, I, I use my fear right at the beginning. I start the first chapter out, you meet Allery. He's already been shot in the back by an assassin and buried alive. And he's digging himself up out of his grave. So um, even though you know things that happen to us are always in our fiction, the story might not exactly be about it, but it's flavored with those kinds of fears, those kinds of insecurities. Uh, and that's what kind of got me started into horror because I found that it was very therapeutic for me. I worked through a lot of emotional, psychological problems uh, through my writing. And probably, probably every horror writer I've ever met, well not everyone, but most of them, have those kinds of fears and insecurities and use their writing. And I think that's kind of why we get into horror. And we want to pass along our fears to you <laughs> and hope that uh, you become as broken as us. Um, I wonder what the statute of limitations is on child protective services. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I got into it. I got into horror through my dad. And we would watch all the Sunday afternoon horror movies in the days before cable and that, that exists. Count Zapula was the guy who would dress up like a vampire and come out of the coffin on Sunday afternoon. And we would watch all the mummy films, the werewolf, all those things. I really got into it via that way, um, and then saw the 1976 version of King Kong, and my dad took me to see that movie, and it was fun because the original King Kong was the first movie his dad ever took him to see. It was the new King Kong, was the first one, my dad, I, first movie I ever saw, same as him, King Kong, many years later, and uh, the scene where Kong is just banging on the bamboo fortress wall, at that point, little Scott started to cry and decide he was just done with all of this. I wanted to go, and he put his arm around me and said, nope, we paid for this, we're staying. And he, he laughed, he thought it was hysterical. So my dad even hung out with his brother. There you go, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're probably best friends. <laughs> and then when we left, and I'm, I'm wiping away tears and holding his hand, as soon as we walked out of the theater, I asked him when we could go see it again. So something tripped at that point that it was really fun to be scared in that very controlled, um, safe environment. And uh, uh, that was somewhere about the third grade, so I've known what I've wanted to do since the third grade, and that was to write Monster Service. Yeah, I think a lot of people who write this stuff, or you're kind of born to it. Um, that's the way it was with me. Uh, you, you, you went to uh, King Kong. I, uh, ever since I can remember, uh, I was watching horror movies, especially anything with monsters. That, that's, that's what I understood horror to be, monsters. And, um, what changed for me over the years was recognizing, well, first of all, I didn't know that they were horror, right, pros. That was a big revelation. I saw horror movies, um, and then realizing there are horror books out there, horror stories, and then finding Edgar Allan Poe. And um, does anybody remember two or three books called The Tales of the Frightened? Very short stories, very much like Saki stories, like two, two to four pages. Of these little sharp shocks, and that was a real, uh, that was a real revelation for me. But about this, you had that incident with King Kong when you were a kid. I had it when um, my uncle took me to see The Haunting, the original Haunting, or we saw it on television. I don't remember. My uncle made sure I saw The Haunting, which I still think is one of the best, maybe the best American haunted house movie ever made, and. I still dream about that movie. Still dream about it that first time I saw it. Mm -hmm. And I think that stuff um, 
gets lodged in your head very young and it just percolates and it, it changes over time so that you can see that there are that there's horror beyond monsters that you can then see horror in the real world and horror becoming people whether they're supernatural people or just in the modern in the modern world Hannibal Lecter but um, discovering books and then discovering people in horror was a big big thing for me I was not born like this. No. <laughs> I was four when I was over at a friend's house and her mom was watching Dark Shadows. Mm. And I got to see Barnabas Collins climb out of the coffin the first time and that was it. <laughs> so, so I had four good years. Yeah. Um, and then things changed again. I was 10 when I read Dracula and I got to the baptism of blood and I thought, mm. all right, this explains everything. So um, when I started to write vampire fiction, what I, I decided the thing that was wrong with Anne Rice was that it wasn't bloody enough. Um, so I don't have the, the sibling thing or the you know, parents who took me to things that they maybe shouldn't have, um, but my father was in Vietnam. He was drafted right after he got out of art school and he was there in 1969. And when he came home from Vietnam, his way of dealing with his PTSD and with the war was to paint it. And the way he represented the war was through drawings and paintings of armies, of skeletons and demons chasing naked human beings through fantastic landscapes. And I grew up with that. When I was born, he was already doing it. I had those paintings were on the wall all through the house. Um, and then the other, Thing, you know, maybe this hap counts as a childhood thing. Um, I was born in Manhattan, and when I was five years old, a boy my age named Aton Potts was kidnapped, and he vanished. Um, he disappeared in the block from his apartment to his bus stop. He was not found until 2012. And he was the first boy in a milk carton, I think. And it's hard to describe what Manhattan felt like then, but this was the year after Son of Sam, and everyone was terrified. Um, Aton's father was a photographer, and he plastered the city in photocopies of his boy's face. And it was on the news every night, it was on the front page of all the newspapers, and I dreamed about Aton for months. I didn't know him, but I felt like I did. I felt like I could, if only I could kind of dream it enough, I would figure out what happened to him. So when a few years later, when I started to discover things like Stephen King, um, Clive Barker through my dad's Omni Magazine subscription, um, Flowers in the Attic, can we talk about Flowers in the Attic? It's like a <laughs> fundamental text here. <laughs> it felt familiar. It felt like a worldview I had already known in some way. And it felt like this was a way to understanding the world that I had found myself in. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, you have people that were introduced to power of books, movies, and just real, just life. You know, real world shit that goes on. Um, so, the oh, first- Wait a minute, you're not gonna answer? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're gonna get off the hook and not answer it? Well, in that case. <laughs> So, I mean, as far as what turned me on to horror, I grew up in a Mexican household, so my mom was very fond of telling me stories about uh, Mexican folklore like La Llorona or that the devil will appear to you dressed in a suit. He always wears, he's always very poshly dressed in a nice black suit, but you can tell it's the devil because he smells of sulfur. So if a man ever approaches you nicely dressed in a black suit and he smells of sulfur, yeah, you're basically talking to the devil. So, I mean, I grew up um, hearing stories like that, and then my mom was also a huge fan of a lot of the older horror classics, um, Universal Monsters, and then Hammer Horror Films, the Roger um, Corman Edgar Allan Poe adaptation. So, even though I was little, my mom, we shared, that was something we shared together. So, I grew up in a, enamored of Christopher Lee, Vincent Price, and then as far as um, literature, the first experience I had with reading horror was Stephen King. So, and then from there, yeah, I mean, there's no turning back. It made a very positive impact on my life um, with introducing the darker elements of life, you know, art, literature, and how 
there's beauty in there. I mean, there's there's the fantastical, there's the fear element, but there is beauty in there is beauty in darkness. There is beauty in horror. Um, and I also have really come to appreciate horror and how it can be used to highlight um, what's going on in the real world as social commentary. And that's actually going to be one of the questions which I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. So that going back to the questions, the you all have ex um, expressed what your what was the experiences that turned you on to horror first? So going on on that, have your views on the genre developed oh, um, over your time as an author, or like when you were first exposed to it, and then once you decided to have your career as as a horror author or dark fantasy author, have your views on the genre changed? I think mine changed right when I, one of the things that finally pushed me into writing the style that I write was read. You know, all the Stephen King stuff, all the vampire stuff, mummies, werewolves, etc. And for me, anything with the supernatural tinge kind of left me wanting at the end because it felt like an open-ended playground. Like some authors, uh, you know, particularly the people uh, who just write and until so they finish the story and they stop, I was kind of more of like an analytical kid. I'm like, well, that's that's not fair. This can of peanut brittle now kills the demon, and it didn't do that before. So I was like, that, and then I read. Uh, Relic, and Relic and Jurassic Park in short order, and I was like, oh shoot, you can use actual science and the structure of the sciences and physics, biology, to create a context where there are a set of rules. And so that, I think, is something that came into more into horror, that's one thing that's changed genre. When you go back to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, very scientific for what we knew at the time, and then there, it, there wasn't a lot in that category until early 80s, I think, when the Jurassic Park came out. And, uh, so that's one of the things I saw change, and then that was my gateway into creating horror. So almost all of my stuff is, is hard science, real physics, and then it takes a leap. If it didn't take a leap, it'd be a bunch of people sitting in a lab where nothing happens with a petri dish, and that's not very exciting. So you've got to take some liberties, but you can create this rule structure where it's, it's more of a mystery. The, the, the reader or the audience can try and guess what's going to happen based on a common rule set everybody has. It's one of the big changes I've seen in the industry. So Lauren had her hand, but oh, to, so sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Um, just yeah, like if one um, someone's to call on them. But going back to the petri dish real quick, Scott. As an egg microbiologist, yeah, I can attest to that. That downtime, it's very boring. <laughs> so, and that's what you don't see on TV and in the books is the downtime between trying to get the results. So yeah. So Lauren. Well, uh, my, my trilogy combines horror, like the Hammer Horror, um, Christopher Lee and his elegant suits and all of that, and space opera, because for me, the Star Wars universe is really dark. It's one of the things I like about it. I mean, there's slavery and people blowing up planets to make a point to, you know, to impress some teenage girl. And, uh, I wanted to carry that over in space opera, kind of combine my love of horror and my love of space opera to, to make something new. And I think there's more of that now where the, the boundaries are fluid going back and forth. And your work is sort of fantasy, but sort of horror. Yeah, I don't, uh, I write horror, but I see it as a different place than uh, my, my major book series, Sandman Slim, which I see as fantasy <coughs> with horrific elements. But then I write horror short stories yeah. uh, on top of that. And for me, the big revelation was finding the contemporary world in horror. I grew up with monster movies and again, the Hammer stuff. It was all 18th, 19th century stuff. And to find horror in your next door neighbor was a big revelation for me. Most of the horror I've written is set in the contemporary world is very much based on, you know, kind of a simple, banal uh, set of characters who aren't special, who just find themselves in strange situations. Um, my story that uh, Ellen Datlow commissioned a while ago, uh, Ambitious Boys Like You, is a uh, house invasion. And it just goes terribly wrong. And that's kind of based on an experience of mine, not home invasion, but uh, I was a little criminal kid, and I stole cars, things like that. And I thought I was a real criminal, a gangster and everything. And then I met real criminals. 
And they were the scariest people I'd ever met. The kind of people who would take you out behind the garage, shoot you in the head, and go have a hamburger without, without ever thinking about it. And so my horror is kind of, more comes from those, those elements than the supernatural, all of the supernatural leaks in there. But for me, it's very much feeling like the real contemporary world. I, I was going to say, I have the opposite from uh -huh. you, because I, Hammer <clears throat> missed me as a kid. I didn't come to Hammer until much later. And so I was always aware that the monster was next door. But mm -hmm. the idea that you could use horror to dissect something like the Enlightenment, to kind of pick that apart, mm -hmm. which is what I've been doing now, um, has been a real late, later life revelation for me. So, different paths. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just going to say that I. I don't, for me, I don't write horror. I know I'm a horror writer, but I don't write horror. I don't set out to write a horror story, really. I usually set out to write a story um, about a character or characters, and it, it, the same that regular, regular people, no, nothing special about them, everyday people, one about their everyday lives who are thrown into um, this fantastical or supernatural occurrence or event. And how do they cope with it? Uh, how do they how do they deal? How do they save themselves? Uh, the supernatural part usually comes again. I'll use your word leaks in, and is is yes, it's part of the story, but it's not it's not something I set out to do. I learned a long time ago not to be a horror writer because my first novel that I got published, I thought I wrote a horror novel. And I sent it off, and, the, and I got a publisher, and they sent the they sent me my author copies. I got this big box of author copies, and I rip it open. I'm so excited, and I take the book out, and on the spine it says science fiction. <laughs> From that point on, I decided I'm not a particular genre writer. I'm a writer. I try to tell stories. Some are more science fiction. Like I'm writing a novel now about um, uh, multiverses. <coughs> parallel universes where this physicist creates a device that will send him to a parallel universe so he can continually kill his girlfriend in other worlds <laughs> because killing her once wasn't enough. <laughs> uh, you know, and then I have, I have stories that are more fantasy that have some demons and um, it's, about, it's really about spontaneous human combustion and my take on spontaneous human combustion and the demons that bring it uh, onto the world. And then I have a homage to regular, to real <coughs> horror with vampires and werewolves and zombies. So I don't, I, I just try to think of a character and build a story around them. And then the supernatural element usually takes a life of its own and envelops it and becomes part of it. So that's why so much of my stuff kind of crosses over those genres because I don't really think in terms of being a horror writer, even though I am. <laughs> no, thank you so much. So that kind of ties into one of the questions that I had also. Um, you know, y'all more or less already answered it with, or if you want to add anything else to it, that basically um, <clears throat> when you're writing hard, do you have a particular goal in mind? Is it to elicit fear? Like you were saying that you don't you don't go down that you don't write hard specifically to elicit fear or is, what's your motive behind it is there another motive behind it like for example social commentary he got to see that side of it um, so is there um, a particular goal that you have goal that you have in mind when you do approach and start writing Hara like is there something you want to make sure to include be it social commentary or just tackling tough issues in your own life or just going the completely fantastical you always want to elicit fear, uh, but it doesn't have to be supernatural fear necessarily. Um, there's a lot of different types of fear. So fear is an element that uh, even in the more fantasy stories and the more science fiction stories that I write, that fear is always in there because I'm always tackling my own fears and those stories help me tackle my own fears. But each story has a particular goal of its own. Um, there's not like one template. Uh, every story, it, really every story usually starts out with a character and then I think about that character and build that character and then uh, the story kind of takes off around them. And whether they're social, 
if I have social commentary in my um, in my stories, it's usually by accident. But I have had people tell me that there's social commentary <laughs> and, and what they got out of it. And I think, hey, cool. Uh, you know, it, it, may, it maybe subconsciously it was my intent, but I might, but I don't know. Uh, so I have had that come up there. But yeah, there are everyday world things that I read about in the newspaper and I see in the news that obviously comes into my my writing and um, and elicits some of those fears that I use in my stories. And of course, every writer is going to have their own beliefs leak into the story. Although I try not to put it out front, never uh, preach. Um, if you get something out of it, great. If you just like it because it's a great story, that's great too. No, thanks for that, Fred. Um, I'm gonna go start with the end. LS, do you have anything you'd like to add to it? Well, I was just going to bounce off of what Fred said. I'm not, I don't, my definition of hard doesn't always include eliciting fear. Um, I think horror is a, I think of horror more as a worldview or as a lens, right? That we can show things that maybe in other genres just wouldn't fly with readers. And so there's things, you know, I, when I turn to horror, when I write something that people tell me are horror, I don't usually write it to scare, I write it to show something that I can't otherwise talk about or that you know, I want to show it plainly. I don't want to have to gloss it, I don't want to have to kind of wrap it in metaphor or something. I want to show something for what it is. So I don't know that fear is necessarily always an element. Can you just go down the table? Yeah, Lauren, you want to go next? Right. Uh, this collection of chapbooks I'm doing now, uh, they're about a young witch who's a monster hunter. And they're, uh, they start with travel. I want to start with a place that I've been or some place I'd like to go. But they're rooted in specific places in the real world. And then from there, uh, the monsters come naturally, right? So if she goes to Venice, there's a siren in the canal. Because she chooses to hunt monsters, she's not always very sensible. And uh, there have been times where I thought she had a death wish, where she'd walk into a situation where I absolutely would not. But uh, having her face those horrors gives me a chance to kind of work through my own drama. Um, I'm interested in the way that the, the tales that different cities have color the people that live there. And uh, she gives me a lens. A lens is a good word to, to look at those, to look at specific places and specific stories. <clears throat> um, for me, a lot of it has to do with the concept of mystery and wonder. I want to show people a, a full world or even just one small thing that is extraordinary and I think some some of that comes from um, the surrealists when I was a kid I'm talking about like five years old I was taken to a uh, surrealist exhibition in New York uh, I think probably at the MoMA and I remember seeing Dali and Duchamp at that and I just got stuck at their paintings trying to understand them and they were showing me a vision of the world that was identifiable as the world but in some twisted way that I had never seen before it was magical it was the it was the real world twisted and I wanted to live in that world and in my stories I want to create that sense of strangeness in the ordinary. And I, I don't necessarily ever want to explain it. I want to leave mysteries as mysteries sometimes. Sometimes they have to be uh, explained and, and solved. But my favorite mysteries are the ones that are just there and you can feel them and you work them out yourself. My goal isn't necessarily to scare people. If that happens, that's cool. I've got one novel called Ancestor, 
where they enucleate a cow egg and put a genetically engineered creature into that egg and then put it back in the cow. And then when that thing gestates and, and comes to term, it's a very messy, messy scene. And I've had farmers send me emails saying they'll never read my work again because they wait for the screen. So like, yeah, that's that's a great compliment. I've scared the farmers of America. Great. But for the most part, my goal is to create characters that are so realistic that they transcend the fictional realm and you feel like you know this person, you experience something alongside this person. And that's straight out of the Stephen King playbook, which is create characters that the reader really, really cares about, then put them in the pressure cooker and see what happens. And if you can increase someone's heart rate or make them anxious about what's gonna to happen to someone that in their brain is maybe not a friend, but has sort of become real, as real as any historic figure that they've never met that they've only read about, and that, I consider that always to be a success. Uh, as far as uh, preaching or putting all this across my own worldview, I always challenge myself when I write a story or a book that everybody gets equal play, no matter what their race, creed, color, gender, political persuasion, etc. cetera. Um, if you've got a far left-wing anarchist, that is, created, that is treated as a real person with real motivations. You go far right-wing conservative, always treated like a real person with real motivations. I try to avoid the simple, easy caricature. Oh, this person's religious, so she's a buffoon. I always try and avoid that. And so I try and, in some ways, challenge my readers, because we all come from our own, especially these days, very polarized worldview. And if I can hopefully make them see someone who thinks the opposite of what they think and go, okay, I don't agree with you, but I have a better understanding of where you're coming from, then I think that does some small amount of good in the world. So if I do my job right, if you guys go get my books, you will all think, Scott thinks exactly like I do. He's right in, <laughs> right in my wheelhouse. Me and him are like this politically. That, that can be a, a good thing. Structure-wise, I call my work a, a satanic Seinfeld episode. Because Seinfeld, you always get those two or three, four disparate plot points, and you don't know how these, not to the last two minutes, you see how they all come together. That's what I'm doing. That's more of a structure than trying to scare someone, is set that puzzle up that hopefully some of you guess and some of you don't guess as to how it's made. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so I wanted to follow up with something Ellis said, that in writing she tries to tackle that taboo topics or topics that you wouldn't otherwise address. Um, a thing I've noticed is that many other genres seem hesitant to address particular issues, such as abuse. So my question is, in your own work, has there been anything that an agent or editor has told you, like this topic goes too far for us, or this is inappropriate and you need to dial it back? Um, not from agents or editors, but I've had a lot of people write me to ask me for trigger warnings, which I feel that I should do, and I've started asking myself for them when stories of mine get picked up that I think might be a little iffy. Um, you know, it's like, I, I want to talk about what I want to talk about. I also don't want to put anyone in some kind of horrific spiral over anything. Um, but yeah, I don't, I have not had agents or editors per se, but again, you don't know a lot of times with the re rejection process what exactly you're getting rejected for either. Yeah. So. Do you, do you put those in the front of the story or do you back yeah. off something triggerish? I don't back off, I just put it up front. Like this is, this story includes X, Y, mm. scenes of X, Y, and Z. Okay. Because I mean, I know, I, 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 I feel very strongly about them. I know some people are wishy-washy or, you know, oh, well, you should just read it and deal with it. Um, I read Kate Elliott's first, uh, I think it's The Crown of Stars, that fantasy series she did with the really creepy rapey guy. And I could not get that book out of my head for months. And I wished to God that somebody had just said up front, this is not your book, please don't read this book, you'll get this out of your head for months. And so having gone through that, like I don't want to put anybody else through that. So I just try to put it out there. It's there, if you want to go there, that's great. Come along with me. If not, you know, no harm, no foul. Thank you, Alas. Um, Richard, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I've never uh, had anything rejected or, or I, I, I work with pretty pretty good editors. I mean, most of the, the horror, specifically horror I've written, um, people like Ellen Datlow uh, have asked for it, um, John Joseph Adams. They know what I do and I, I know what I do and I, I know my own limits. And for me, I the big thing that I don't 
go for is sexual violence because I think it gets trivialized in a lot of popular fiction or, or simplified and I don't ever want to do that to something that life, you know, it can be life changing. Um, that's, my, that's my one bit of censorship for myself is I just don't want to ever go into that and ever, ever take a chance on trivializing that particular act, which, which is a horrific thing. Just piggyback right. on that, my big thing is like is uh, babies and kids, uh, and actually puppies. Uh, yeah. I I don't I don't uh, I, the one thing I absolutely stay away from is anything that has to do with pedophiles or pedophilia or children getting tortured or uh, things like that. I think that goes too far. Now there are some things with children. I don't have a problem with Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, where the child uh, dies and they bury him, and he comes back to life as something else. But um, but if it gets into, I've read some things where the where it actually got into like torture scenes and things like that, and I, I draw the line there. I, I'll put it down every time. Um, just don't don't mess with kids too much for me. Thank you, Fred. Lauren Scott, do you have anything you'd like to add to it, Lauren? I, I've only had two things. I think I've gotten absolute firm pushback from an editor at a publishing house. One was weird. It was uh, character was a self cutter, and he would when he got stressed out, and he would cut himself, and that provided some form of release, and then he would badge it up. And the editor's like, "That's ridiculous. We're not going to have that in there. Like, this is an actual thing about what people do." Yeah. So that was weird, and it was a whole TV show on that. Was that the, the, um, Shark Objects? Oh, is that right? Uh, with that. Amy, uh, Amy something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the whole thing. She goes back to investigate this, these missing kids, and she is a self cutter from when she was a teenager and starts self cutting I'll again. Send that editor the DVD. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's out now. So that was rejected for you, Scott? Yeah, he he like he was a great editor, but once in a while he was like, that's not going in this book, and I was still it was only like book number two, so I didn't realize that. Everything the editor says is largely just sort of a suggestion that you can ignore if you want to. Uh, and then um, some of my female antagonists, I got pushed back on them, that they were too violent or too over the top. And it was uh, confusing as a young writer, because I'd be like, this was a dude, you wouldn't have said that ever. Yeah, I was gonna ask